Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rishur Nikhil. I work at BlueSpec, and I'm here to give you a quick update on the ISA Formal Spec Technical Group uh, within the foundation. So as you can see, this is a list of the members in the group. It's a diverse group from industry, from, la from academy, academia, and lots of individuals have just signed up, even though they may, they, maybe their companies or universities are not yet signed up as Risk v Foundation members. It's a lot of very good experts here in the field. For many of them, this is their day job. So uh, we're in good hands here in terms of the quality of people we have in our group. We meet, about, uh, we meet weekly on a con call. Uh, many of the people here are members of multiple technical groups, but the group I spe specifically want to mention is the memory model formal spec, about which you heard yesterday from Dan Lustig. You can think of the instruction ISA spec and the memory model spec as the yin and yang that have to sort of lock together to together form the full uh, formal spec for, for, for the ISA. So, uh, um, so let me just say, for those of you who are not too familiar with formal specs and what they're good for, why they're there, let me say a few words. So it's all about being very precise about functional correctness without being cluttered with any implementation level detail. So it's a very high level abstract specification so that against which we can compare various things. So for example, on the left you see a compiler correctness uh, question that one might ask. You're compiling some high-level language to uh, machine code. So uh, how do you know the machine code is doing what you expect it to do based on the high-level language? And for, to do that, you typically need a spec for the high-level language so that you know what the high-level program is supposed to be doing. You need a spec for the ISA so that you know what the machine code is doing, and you need to be able to show equivalence between those. And you typically, this is more than testing. You're not just testing for some particular run of the program. You want to run it for all inputs of the program. And further, you want to go even higher to say that my compiler is correct, namely for any high-level source program I give, my compiler will produce the correct uh, uh, the uh, RISC-V instructions for that. Uh, and for this, the starting point is to have a formal spec for uh, the ISA. Uh, on the bottom side, what you see is people who have many implementations of RISC-V. They may be in software, like simulators like Spike or Blue Spec Scissor or Kimu, for example. And uh, you want to know whether the, that implementation, which is an interpreter of either in software or hardware of RISC-V instructions, is it doing the right thing? So once again, a key starting point is the um, the formal spec for the instructions itself. Um, so, but basically the unifying theme is formal correctness, and uh, uh, one of our group members, Adam, will be giving a talk next, which will go into a lot more uh, details about what they're doing in their research group about that. Um, uh, another group member of ours, Clifford Wolf, who's around here, has uh, been playing with this also for some time now, and he has essentially found a bug in almost every uh, target that he's looked at, including the, the prose written spec, in Spike, in his own implementations, in other people's implementations, and so on. So the purpose of the spec is really to try to eliminate these kinds of uh, issues. So let me give you a small example of a corner case that might be uh, of interest. So here, what I have here is an instruction, which is a CSR instruction. It's supposed to take the value that's in the A0 reg register and write it to the instret, or which counts the number of instructions retired. Now, normally, every time you execute an instruction, you're incrementing the instructions retired register. So what happens when you execute this instruction? If A0 had 100, is the final value 100, or is it 101? So it's a kind of an ambiguity that we need to nail down. Uh, I'm not going to go into what's right or wrong about it, but it's, it gives you a kind of a flavor of uh, trying to get all the corner cases and subtleties out here. So to summarize, what a formal spec is, it's a precise specification of each instruction, uh, what it does, uh, and then compositions of instructions, which are programs. Um, and um, uh, initially, you, you can think of that just for single-threaded programs, but of course it needs to be also handle uh, multi-threading and so on. For the first two levels, just the instructions and single-threaded programs, the spec can be quite simple, uh, but once it starts, you're going into multi-threading and you start interacting with uh, the weak memory models, for example, it's going to get a little more, more complicated. Okay, so... Uh, 
a very high priority for us is that the formal spec needs to be accessible. It shouldn't be written in, to, in some uh, exotic notation that very few people, perhaps armed with PhDs, are the only people who can read it. We really want it to be accessible to uh, compiler writers. They should be able to, able to use it as a reference to understand precisely what uh, each instruction is supposed to do. Architects who are designing implementations should be able to look, uh, refer to the spec, uh, et cetera. So this is a very high priority thing for us. Um, precision completeness, of course. And as I said, we're going to, we have to start dealing with non-determinism, particularly when we're dealing with weak memory models. There's actually non-determinism even in single-threaded programs. And we need to put an envelope onto that, what uh, in the non-deterministic outcomes, what's allowed and what's not allowed. Then the other requirement here is that uh, the formal spec is not simply a passive spec that somebody reads, but uh, people are going to be uh, using this in mechanized systems to prove things correct, to prove your compiler correct, to prove an implementation is correct, or to prove that a change that you made in an implementation hasn't broken something. So you need to be able to mechanize things. So of course we want it machine readable, um, and in, it, it's nice to be able to execute it also so that you can directly execute RISC-V programs on, on the spec itself. So, um, uh, so the first question is sort of what notation should we use, et cetera, since there are many different formal tools and each formal tool has its own particular notation and uh, you know, uh, different research groups will be doing different things. So what we have done is to choose a... Uh, a very simple least common denominator that will easily feed into uh, all these tools and it's also easily accessible to human readers who are reading it directly. So we're basically taking a very simple functional programming uh, uh, notation, um, uh, functional programming 101 basically, and specifically we're going to use the syntax of Haskell uh, but only use very simple stuff in Haskell. So. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with any functional programming language, Scheme, uh, Scala, um, Lambda Calculus, uh, ML, et cetera, uh, or, or even the functional subsets of Swift or, Java or, or, or uh, Python, for example, it should be approachable. I'll give you some examples to hopefully convince you that we are getting there. Um, but we will also provide connections to formal tools via a parser so that you can easily connect it up to uh, other tools. So logistically, our approach is roughly to follow the, the modular sort of extension structure that is uh, in the definition already. Uh, so we're starting with uh, RV32i, RV64i, uh, the M, the in, that's the integer multiplied divide, and the M privilege mode. And we'll be adding things uh, later on. And actually, this first step is in, in pretty good shape uh, already. So just to give you a, a, a sense of the look and feel of uh, what it is and hopefully persuade you that it's easily approachable, these are some excerpts from the spec as it currently stands. Things are in flux, so things will change, but this will give you a flavor of things. So at the top, what you see is a, an algebraic data type. You can think of it in an abstract syntax tree of instructions. You can read it as an instruction is either an invalid instruction or it's a load word and it has those three fields with those particular types, or it's an add i with those three fields with those types, and so on and so forth. Then we provide a decode function, which is in some sense very simple sort of pattern match on 32 bits, which is the instructions, and it uh, opens out those 32 bits into this abstract uh, algebraic type. Once we have the decode, then, then we can um, uh, here's an excerpt of the execute clauses. So conceptually, we do an execute clause for each of the instruction types. And you can see it's fairly readable. If the second one shows that when execute is applied to a BEQ instruction that has RS1, RS2, and immediate 12 fields in it, uh, these are the things you do. You get your uh, read RS1, you read RS2, you get your PC, you check X equals Y, and, and you set PC, et cetera. Uh, so, um, uh, it's very straightforward, certainly for the single-threaded case. It's going to get a little more complicated when you start going into non-determinism due to multi-threading, et cetera. Uh, finally, you have to have some way to compose these together. This is, again, just an example of what it would look like for the simple single-threaded case where you're not worried about complex memory models, et cetera, and it reads just like uh, you might uh, see in an interpreter, et cetera. So, um, um, 
the uh, uh, so in some sense, it is a little interpreter that we are writing for RISC-V. And you might wonder, uh, well, isn't spike an interpreter? Why don't we use that as a spec or blue spec scissor or Kimu or something like that? And just to reiterate, the, the idea is uh, to be completely uh, uh, cleaned out from, separated away from uh, implementation details that might clutter the details of that. So uh, many of these other specs, like uh, C-based ISSs, for example, uh, also have performance considerations or other kinds of considerations uh, which detract from that. And secondly, it needs to be able to connect in easily to uh, existing formal tools, et cetera. So that's a quick uh, uh, summary of uh, where it's at, where we've been working for about four, uh, three and a half months at, at this point. And uh, we're basically done with that top bullet that you see out there. Um, and uh, I, I expect that the next hi highest priority is uh, to get the privilege spec S in also so that we can uh, be able to do things like boot Linux, et cetera, uh, on the spec itself. And then uh, not clear in what order, but we will need to start getting into other extensions. Uh, the accessibility, the, uh, priority that I mentioned earlier is something not only for people to be able to refer to, but uh, RISC-V being modular in the sense of people might be doing their own extensions. Hopefully they can use this as a starting point if they want to extend the semantics for their own particular extensions and so on. So I think I have 28 seconds left. I'll quit at that point. And thank you.